You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Bill Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network on the landofisrael.com where we have only a little bit more than two months ahead of our September 17th election and I have absolutely no idea what is going on anymore. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have no idea who's running with who anymore. Um, and until then, who can predict anything about this election? Everything is very much up in the air and will be decided in the days ahead. Nothing has actually even changed since the election was initiated because everybody's waiting for that August 1st deadline when the list will be submitted. And until we know what the lists are going to be, speculation is fruitless. Um, and so, uh, having said that, I know nothing. Here we have on the line Jeremy Sultan, <laughs> who is a political analyst who is very close to Naftali Bennett and the Yelich Uh Jeremy, thank you for coming here on Inside Israel today. Thank you, and uh, it's great to be with you, Gil. What's going on? <laughs> Well, that's that's pretty much what um, that's the beginning of just about every conversation I've had over the last month to six weeks. I think um, what what you said there at the top is really the thing that all of us need to remember. At the moment, everything is speculation. And on August 1st, we'll have uh, at 10 p.m. We'll have all of the uh, answers in. And until now, until that point, what we're going to do is talk about the various possibilities and scenarios. Um, because if we don't, then uh, we wouldn't be doing uh, our jobs as analysts. And also, there'd be absolutely nothing for people to read. So uh, I think it's important to go ahead and explore a lot of those scenarios. Uh, I can tell you this is also a very, very big time for scenario polling. Um, yeah. This is also a very big time for private polling. Uh, the public polls are interesting. However, as everyone has noticed, there's a lot less of them this time versus uh, the cycle of the April election. And that's because pollsters are working just as hard as they were in the past. It's just uh, this time there's a lot more interest in checking all the various scenarios. And this is being done not only by the parties that are looking at their own uh, possible scenarios and situations. This is also being done by people who are looking uh, to see what competitors might do and how they might need to react as well. Um, that, that's a very good point, Jeremy. People don't realize that the polls that they see on TV, those are the unprofessional ones where they ask only one question and they want an answer very quick. Uh, whereas there are, there is an industry in Israel of actual very professional polls that are being taken as we speak right now in which the final that will impact the final decisions that these parties are going to be making about how to run together and with whom exactly so over the next uh two weeks and uh we're ready on tuesday so uh two weeks and three days um that's going to be what a majority of parties are going to be focusing on I can tell you the most interesting one um, that I've not seen reported since I've seen a lot of them that have been uh, reported. The most interesting one that I've seen is uh, the scenario polling for a Lapid Lieberman list. And uh, in this that situation, sounds far out. yes, it is definitely far out. But um, uh, that's the thing about scenario polling. You check a lot of different things, whether um you think they make sense or not, and you try to look at the results and see if in the end that's something that you can um, live with or if uh, sometimes you end up seeing that things are a little bit different than what your gut feeling was. I mean, that is really the point of polling. It's the best thing that we have in terms of tool um, to gauge the public opinion so that politicians don't make a... Um, uh, you know, don't make decisions uh, from their gut and just on impulse that they try to get. Uh, again, it's, you know, at times uh, flawed scientific methodology, since there's a margin of error that a lot of times can put you uh, within the, the electoral threshold. But um, 
it gives you the best opportunity to try to gauge what um, the Israeli people are thinking. Because uh, if Israeli politicians go ahead and listen to the people around them, most of the time they'll think that um, uh, even if uh, they're getting four seats in the polls, that they have enough support to be prime minister. Uh, you're talking about Ehud Barak, who thinks he's running for prime minister when he has only four seats in the polls. Who's actually even said that in his own private polls he's getting four seats, yet he still thinks that he's running for prime minister. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have a very cute baby in the background, and we don't want that <laughs> baby silenced. This is Israel. We're very proud to be a society that focuses on children and not on work. Uh, that is one of the things that make Israel great. We are rebuilding the Jewish people after the Holocaust, and I think there should be a baby crying in the background of every show here on the Land of Israel Network. So please don't silence that baby, Jeremy. Um, so uh, you mentioned David Barak. So we'll start with the left, and then we'll move on to the right. Um, this might be the only show... Uh, on the Land of Israel Network that does that. So <laughs> starting on the left, yes. um, the latest speculation is that uh, Amir Peretz and Ehud Barak can't get along. Twelve years ago, Amir Peretz was replaced by Ehud Barak uh, as labor leader, and um, instead of letting him stay on for a few days as defense minister, fired him by fax on a Friday afternoon while Amir Peretz was in the Prime Minister's office talking to Ehud Olmert and the Chief of Staff of the Army about whether to attack Syria that weekend. And uh, since then, they haven't exactly been able to get over that particular disagreement. And so it's looking like Labour will be running with merits, maybe a draft somehow Tsipi Livni or Lee Levy, um, and leave Ehud Barak out in the cold with those four seats on the borderline of the threshold. Um, is that the most likely scenario, Jeremy, or is there something new going on that I don't know about? Well, I think uh, it's very interesting in terms of Orly Levy and her uh, options, right? She has uh, options from the Likud, from Blue and White. Um, also, as you mentioned, from the various parties to the left as well. Uh, I don't know which one she's going to take. I think, obviously, she's looking to see who's going to give her uh, what she wants in terms of a ministerial position. And I think she's also probably going to wait until the last minute because she wants to bet on the winning horse. For whatever reason, people seem to think that Gantz still does have a shot at forming a coalition. I'm sure we'll get to that in a moment. But um, I think she's going to wait until the last minute and she'll be one of the last names to join, um, perhaps not even making a decision until two or three days out. In terms of CP Levy, my understanding is she'll only come in if everyone goes in on the left, meaning merits, labor, and uh, the Israeli Democratic Party, um, for that to happen, of Barak. yes, of Ehud Barak, for that to happen, um, uh, as you mentioned, will be very difficult. You have a lot of egos. It makes more sense to have two of the three, just in terms of what is um, actual, actually doable. However, Tsipi Livni, who left the political scene after she called the entire left to get together and to unite under one list to defeat Netanyahu, the only way that she could really justify coming back um, after sitting out to the April election is if she could uh, point out that she's coming back as uh, playing a Gabi Ashkenazi role, if you will, as um, this, this large idea of getting everyone uh, that is to the right of the joint list and to the left of blue and white together in one big party. Uh, we saw in the Israel Hayom poll that if you do have such a list of the four big personalities that I just mentioned, of uh, Horvitz, Peretz, uh, Barak, and Livni, the potential is 19 seats. But as we also mentioned, uh, the public polls are not as accurate as um, a lot of the private ones uh, that is being done. And I would doubt that private polls would have it at 19 seats simply because that would require a very, very large number of uh, voters to leave blue and white, um, which I, I just don't see happening, at least at this point in the campaign, where, uh, again, a majority of Israelis would rather consider themselves, um, in terms of the anti-Netanyahu camp, they'd rather consider themselves center then actually uh, go ahead and put themselves on the left side of the political map. Okay, so it's interesting. You said 19 seats potentially 
for a party running all together to the left of blue and white. And there was a famous Israel Hayom poll uh, that found that there's 19 seats ready on the right of the Likud if everybody runs together. Uh, how seriously do you take that poll and, and what is the likelihood of the six or seven? Rabbi Tao, another um, rabbi out there for right, the party so, called Noam, six or seven parties there on the right to unite together? Well, um, again, you know, you're talking about the same uh, the same entity that's ordering the poll. You're talking about the same pollster uh, taken out around the same date, um, published in, in, in the same paper, if I recall. And uh, yes, I mean, in, in that poll in which they get 19 seats, unlike the blue and white, um, uh, not necessarily dropping as much as it should. In that poll, you actually do see the Likud dropping down to 25 seats, which would have just a six-seat difference between a hypothetical Ayelet Shaked list of uh, what they pulled there is five parties that didn't um, pull Ralph Tao's party, maybe because um, the deadline of registering new parties has already passed, and it's very difficult to take a lot of these um, uh, jokes as uh, uh, serious, but I do know that people like to um, look at every potential scenario. He bought course, an old party. He can run with it. Yeah, if, if you go ahead and you buy it and you're able to file and meet all of the requirements, which, uh, again, he needs to make sure he has a professional to, to help him through, he can go ahead and move forward with that. But uh, what they did look is if the five parties of Haimina Khadash by UD, Tkuma slash National Union, um, along with Zehut and Otsma Yudit, um, that if the five of them ran together, yes, that would be 19 seats. I think that's a, again, as I said, uh, very interesting in terms of a starting point, in terms of a public poll. I'm not so convinced that that would be the um, final result uh, in terms of uh, what uh, election would uh, bring us. Of course, it depends a lot what's going to happen on the Likud list and what would happen, of course, uh, within uh, who is the leader of, uh, of that list. I think it's quite obvious that Ayala Shaked would bring a lot more votes than Rabbi Rafi Peretz would. It's obvious to you, but not obvious to Rafi Peretz. That's possible that uh, it's not obvious to him. It's also possible that it's obvious to him and he's trying to posture as much as possible so that he's in a position where he uh, uh, might not have to give up that position. Um, we have to point out that in terms of the five parties we talked about, that the Bayat UD owns four units of campaign funding, the seats of Rav Rafi Peretz, uh, Moti Ogev Idit Silman, as well as Rav Eli Ben Dehan from the Ahi party that ran together with the Likud and broke off and is now part of them. So when you do have the money, uh, that does help you with the negotiations. And uh, there is no secret that there are a lot of negotiations going on between the various parties on the right. I'd say the biggest questions that uh, people are asking themselves internally is number one, um, how, how does Zahut and Feiglin fit in when Feiglin still thinks that uh, he can appeal to non-right-wing voters despite the evidence of the electoral results that showed that he was not able to, um, as well as the question of it does bringing in Otsma, uh, which is a Kahanist party, does that drive away more votes than it brings in by bringing them in? Um, yeah, Faglin said he's disgusted by Otsma, and Faglin's party has basically fallen apart. It's There's a lot going on behind the scenes with that, too. There is indeed a lot going on behind the scenes in all of the five parties. I, I've heard of even internal disagreements within uh, each one of those uh, parties that we talked about. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are other potential ones that might join. Uh, you still have also Eli Yishai, uh, who almost ran with the union of right-wing parties. Uh, it was a question up to the last minute if you would join that or not. Um, so there are a lot of question marks on the right, a lot more than on the left. There are a lot more personalities. There are a lot more parties. Um, also, unlike um, the parties that we mentioned on the left, you do have a lot of um, interesting situations, such as uh, the fact that you would have to accommodate both Naftali Bennett and Ayala Shaked in Haimina Khadash. Um, if you look at Bayat UD, the significant amount of support that Moti Ogev has, who won the Central Committee vote uh, there, um, uh, he also has uh, a lot of sway 
in terms of what's going on there beyond what Rav, uh, Ravi Peretz has. Um, so you have a lot of personalities that feel that they need to get uh, something tangible uh, in terms of the next government. So it makes it very difficult to play around with um, the cards of shuffling that deck. But um, but whatever happened to July 15th, uh, Jeremy, yes. uh, Naftali Bennett said all along, don't talk to me until July 15th. Then I'm going to really figure things out. And uh, I believe July 15th came and went and nothing July, happened. July 15th was yesterday. And if you look at a lot of reports that uh, uh, you might see from this morning on Twitter and on the various uh, gossip blogs of uh, Sergei and Kupa and so on and so forth, you'll see that there are various reports of uh, meetings between um, uh, Shaked's people, Bennett's people, um, by D people, um, others uh, as well are included in some of those articles. So um, it's very, uh, since uh, you know, I'm not in position to uh, authorize officially, I'm saying there's a lot of reports that are there that what one could look at that could come to the conclusion that yesterday was the start of a uh, different chapter uh, in terms of the talks and negotiations, whether they're official or unofficial. Of the talks the being official views. now and unofficial before, because July 15th happened? I said, if I'm, if I'm uh, going ahead and looking at the reports uh, that I found on my Twitter feed, and I'm sure they're on your Twitter feed as well, that uh, they would indicate that they've gone from, from a more uh, unofficial and indirect fashion to uh, something that resembles more of a negotiating team as well as uh, more official uh, type of talks. And yesterday was uh, the 15th. Okay, uh, so Ayelet is really the, the biggest factor here. She has a decision to make, and the longer she waits with the decision, the more she gets compared to Tsipi Livni as the indecisive person who can really fit in any party, and that might make her look bad. Um, do you see her making a decision by the end of the week uh, in, because of her reputation potentially being on the line here? I think uh, you have two sides of this. Um, there's the positive side in, in the thing that until she makes a decision, um, every day they are going to talk about her as we are right now. Every day they are going to print various speculation for her. Um, besides whatever stuff she might be doing, there will be other people uh, conducting various polls, checking what she is doing, and she will continue to be the talk of the town. That is a positive aspect of her decision not to make a decision yet. Uh, the negative part is, as you pointed out, uh, it looks indecisive. It looks like um, she's waiting for the best offer. And um, it looks like she's uh, acting as a politician and calculating what it is that she is trying to do. And um, I understand that in a lot of circles that's looked upon as very negative. Uh, the third aspect that sort of puts the two of those together is that Israelis do have a short memory. And if we are going to look at the fact that when a decision does need to be made uh, on August 1st, that still leaves 47 days. For an, election, for an actual election campaign to happen. And most likely within a few days, or at the most a few weeks, people will forget the decision-making process which led her to the decision, and instead will be focusing more either on the horse race between the leadership uh, of the various parties that are horse racing towards the finish line, or towards yeah. the issues in policy, which in, in some countries happen to be the focus point in election campaigns. But not in Israel. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, I, I think I caught you in a contradiction there. Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, you're saying, which makes a lot of sense, that August 1st, the campaign really starts for real. And before that, anything that happened won't be remembered. And therefore, Ayala Chiket can get away with negotiating with however many parties she wants. Uh, or Lee Levy can go away with negotiating with however many parties or, or not answering the phone from any of the parties and then auctioning herself off in the last 24 hours. Fine, I get that. But meanwhile, you, you gave me a, a veiled uh, eulogy for Benny Gantz 
who has purposely not said anything yet, even when he went on national TV, even when they had this week their campaign of official launching that uh, I myself did not attend, and uh, as opposed to the last election, I went to all their events and read every word of his speech, which was translated into English, and still did not find a single sentence worthy of being put in the newspaper. Uh, Yair Lapid's speech was also translated into English, and I didn't find anything particularly exciting there. Um, why eulogize them now when they haven't really started yet? They're saving the goods for after they know what their real competition is on both sides on August 1st. I think um, the, the understanding that I have from uh, the Blue and White camp is that, and this is also from talking with some of their MKs, that um, their, their math has um, Kathleen's voters not moving to Likud and, and gone. You have Lieberman, who's no longer part of the right-wing camp and a potential partner for them. And um, they think that they don't even really need to say too much. Um, a big reason of why they haven't done anything until now is because they're trying to make a decision whether in this campaign that's going to start August uh, 2nd, um, uh, it's a Friday, but I guess for blue and white, they can do that on a Friday. Um, and they have in the past, as you remembered, uh, done stuff. Every Friday they do um, something that's yeah. really annoying. So, so I'll tell you that they're trying to make a decision whether they need to be running against the Likud or if they have to go more to the left. Because if you do have this super party that opens up on the left, what is going to happen as a result of that is that there is the potential that this uh, Hud Barak-led party or Amir Peretz led party, or Tsipi Livni, uh, I doubt they would put Horvitz at the top, but uh, whoever leads that party could potentially um, uh, pull enough votes away from blue and white uh, to put them in a situation where uh, they're more or less not a big gap between the two parties. Again, I would still assume that the blue and white party would be uh, larger, but if we have a situation where blue and white is uh, is lower down from let's say 35 seats to uh, something uh, like 25 seats, and this um, big party on the left ends up getting uh, something let's say uh, like um, uh, 18 seats or 20 seats, uh, you have a situation where it's very difficult for them to then turn around to Lieberman or to the ultra orthodox parties, which seems to be one of the plans that Gantz is. Uh, is looking towards. It's, it's going to be just very, very difficult for them. And, and because of that, they're not sure they want to start their campaign and go too far to the right, because they might have to bring it back and, and go to the left afterwards. So they're, they're not going to say anything until August 1st, till they know. And, and this is, of course, the problem with the centrist party, where you don't know if you're campaigning to your right or to your left until you actually know who your competitors are. So I, Especially a centrist party without actual views. Well, of course, uh, the, the, the common denominator between uh, the parties on that list is uh, that none of them... Uh, like Netanyahu. Yeah, and, and, and that's fine. And that's the, I wouldn't call that a, a policy. Um, what I've actually heard very interestingly from a lot of the diplomats that, that I've met with, that blue and white pretty much sell themselves to, to a lot of diplomats as Likud without Netanyahu. Um, which I think makes it very difficult for people to take them seriously within the diplomatic community. But I think that also a lot of people uh, within Israel sort of feel the same way. And uh, if you do go ahead and, and someone like you has read their platform, they have tried to go very much to the right on a lot of issues and sort of have tried to mirror a lot of the positions that a lot of people on the more liberal side of the Likud, such as my neighbors Yuval Steinitz and Sachi and Agby feel, uh, and perhaps a lot less than um, what we see from a lot of other people. Um, in, in the end, Jeremy, yes. w w that anyone but BB campaign, that's what it's all about in this election, just like it was in the last election. And when it'll accept that in this election, it'll be even harder to form a government afterward. And the one common denominator that there will be is hate. Hatred of Netanyahu. No one will be... You can have very strange bedfellows um, because as long as they agree on that one issue, that might be the only issue that 61 people can agree on at all. So if that's the only issue that there is, 
that's a, a very serious threat. I, I again, Prime I'm just not so convinced. Like I said, we have a situation where the Arabs are not able to um, nominate somebody in the president's house. They're not able to vote for a government that they don't agree. And even if we look at such as um, the security net that they provided for the Rabin government, that was in the middle of the term. They've never actually, as non-Zionist parties, um, went and helped form a Zionist government. And I've heard from talking with um, some of the Arab MKs that they don't really see much of a difference between Gantz and Netanyahu when they're looking at a um, party that has three IDF chiefs, chief of staff in it that have um, uh, a, quite a large body toll in terms of Palestinian deaths on their backs. Um, they don't necessarily see a lot to benefit from that. Let's remember the Arab parties voted for an early election. They voted with the government. Uh, the outgoing government and coalition uh, to put us in this situation of having a September okay. election. And it's very possible uh, that, that the fact that Gans is building on them is going to be, again, his downfall uh, in the September okay. election. Well, thank you so much for your time here and helping us get our thoughts together. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't listen to this show beyond the next few days because all of it could be outdated <laughs> a few days from now which is the beauty of democracy, the only thing that will endure from this show uh, that we know is truth is that baby crying in the background. Uh, editor, please don't take that out because that is the ultimate truth. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Gil. And thank you, listeners, for being with us here inside Israel today. Uh, have a great week ahead. Hopefully that next week we'll all be a lot smarter. Shalom from Jerusalem. Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Check out my latest show this week with the one and only Israel Maydad. Hear how things are developing for the Jewish community in Judea and Samaria. We believe that it's part of Israel. We believe that it will be part of Israel. But if you come to a court of law, we are Israeli citizens living in a military government ruled area, which is not fully sovereign in the state of Israel. You don't want to miss this show only here on Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at the Land of